Hello. Hi. Hi. It's me again. Yeah, all right. Okay, so, Vic Oliver. I like Vic Oliver. I first met Vic Oliver in 2006 at the Dunedin LinuxConf. And he had this lab contraption of what he thought the RepRap gang might be trying to do in the coming years. And he said, well, we're going to do this extrusion thing of plastic and it would be something like a glue gun. And he showed a glue gun and I think there was nothing. A year and a half later, they were printing stuff. And I thought, so that was so utterly cool, so I kept an eye on him. And he's still a very interesting guy. So, and he's still up to no good. So, over to Vic. Thank you. Uh, I got into this uh, 3D printing in a kind of roundabout way. Um, in New Zealand, we've got this, uh, this stuff called Panamu. It's a uh, greenstone kind of jade. And I was given some, and I wanted to carve it. And there's sort of cultural sensitivity attached to this stuff, so I wanted to make a good job of it. And I, th I wanted to know what the object I was going to make would look like before I made it. And I thought, you're a programmer, you idiot. Use some design software. So I did. I started playing around with CAD software. It was pretty primitive back then. Um, and I, after a while, decided I actually preferred playing with the CAD software to carving greenstone. Um, and one thing led to another, and I started doing moonscapes. And then I ended up talking to this guy from NASA, and I actually ended up designing uh, real uh, flight hardware and doing engineering videos and things for, uh, for various aerospace companies and um, making satellites and launching them and everything. It was all, all terribly exciting. Um, and I moved on to, uh, to life support systems. And one of the things about a life support system is it's really, really important that you keep it going. <laughs> and so if it breaks, you have to be able to fix it. So you need a machine that can make bits for a life support system. All right? But if that machine breaks, you're stuffed. So you need a machine to make bits for the machine that fixes the life support system. All right? And so you can see why sort of self-replicating machines sort of kind of got important fairly quickly. But what never occurred to me for some time was that one of these things would actually be quite handy here on Earth. Um, and a chap called Dr. Adrian Bowyer uh, pointed this out to me from Bath University. And so I started playing around with the, with the famous exploding glue guns uh, and lots of Meccano. And um, we, we, that, that is a, uh, pretty much a totally mechanical 3D printer that just prints short pieces of tube. But it demonstrated that we could do it in, uh, in ordinary room temperature conditions. Uh, and that the layers would bond together and you didn't actually need uh, too complicated equipment to, to, to pull it off. Um, and by uh, May 2006, uh, we had actually got the design sorted out to the point where we had a machine that could print the parts for another machine. And as soon as I finished the child machine in that photo, um, we started printing parts out for the grandchild machine with it. Um, and uh, ever since, that image has stalked me everywhere. <laughs> um, so it took The Economist and other notable newspapers a while to catch on to what the implications of, of having a machine that can make itself um, and 3D printing were. Um, but one of the uh, fairly early effects of this was it really dropped the bottom out of the price of 3D printer hardware. Um, we had created something that could create itself, and that was rather, rather difficult to, um, to stop. And the fact that we were doing it uh, free and open source was, it was completely mind-boggling to all the traditional companies in, in that sphere at the time. So this new, new monster we had created, um, why was it so successful? Well, because of evolution. Now. There is the most, uh, there is the most um, uh, successful bird on the planet. It is the domestic chicken. Why is it the most successful bird on the planet? 
Well, because it's stupid, it can't fly very well, and it tastes good. <laughs> now, normally this isn't very good news from an evolutionary standpoint. However, what it did was it, it um, presented itself to us 5,000 years ago, and we've looked after it ever since. All right? It evolved with us, to, uh, catering to our needs, much in the way as 3D printers are doing at the moment. And uh, by the way, the population of uh, chickens in the world is now 19 billion, and they outnumber us three to one. So it had to be open source, so that people could take the design and evolve it and distribute it, so that the successful designs, uh, designs would propagate into the future. So if you, when you look back to the beginning of this, you realize that we had a bit of a bootstrapping problem. Right, because there weren't very many 3D printers out there, let alone ones that had already built themselves, so we actually needed to have a machine out there that could build the first 3D printers that could build themselves. All right. uh, so, the, uh, so, so some of the RepRap team um, put a bit of money in the direction of um, a, a guy called uh, Zach Smith, and he created uh, a, a little company making laser cut 3D printers called MakerBots, um, and, and they were open source and they got modified all over the place. Then along came a chap called Bree Pettis, uh, who um, befriended Zach and then uh, ejected him from his own company um, and uh, alienated the 3D printer community by making the design proprietary. Um, oh, yes, and then he sold it to Stratasys. So open source, sudden, uh, open source 3D printing suddenly finds itself butting heads with the big guys again. Uh, silly patents were, were awarded in the 3D printing field. Apparently putting the thing in a box to keep it warm is a novel step. Didn't seem like Hiding the seams on the inside was a novel step. All right, how does my t-shirt do? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> And, and then, you know, um, Stratasys and uh, so they partnered with Microsoft, and so Microsoft pushes their software first and all this sort of thing, pushing the brand. Um, and, and, and open source 3D printing found itself under attack, not just through there, um, but because <laughs> the, the politicians started realizing, hey, what, what, what could people do with this? They, they could. Um, they could, they could, they could, they could print guns and 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 drugs and gold and gems and and, and yeah. Maurice Williamson got a little bit carried away there. Um, and the interesting thing about him was he betrayed the agenda beautifully, uh, because what's wrong with printing asthma medication? All right. Um, if I could print gold, all right, and I, we, we, sorry, we, we haven't made an alchemist here, but if I could print gold or gems, what exactly is wrong with that? Uh, I, I can't actually see a problem with printing gold and gems, can you? So, I mean, obviously, it, 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 was, it was a power crap. It was a power crap. Uh, it was a ploy for control of, of new technology. Um, but we'd made it open source, which made it really rather unstoppable. Um, now, behind me is a picture of an e-waste tip in Togo. This is where all your old electronic equipment goes to die and leach heavy metals into the soil of some poor bugger's country. Um, now, we made, we made that uh, uh, open source for really good reasons. Any working 3D printer can print a RepRap. And anybody uh, with sufficient enthusiasm and a large supply of spare parts um, can also build a 3D printer. So you have these uh, young um, innovative chaps and chapesses in Togo um, taking our old e-waste apart and building 3D printers out of it. Now interesting things happen when you start putting people in um, a, a, an environment where their materials are restricted. They start having new ideas on using old stuff and uh, so you, you end up with uh, things like uh, Cubans inventing an epoxy resin that they make out of bananas and, and all sorts of strange stuff being made in Palestine because the Israelis <coughs> won't let them bring aluminium in and things like that. Um, but 3D printing 
also gives these, these chaps ways of, of, uh, of scaling up, of, of going into production, of, of spreading this from village to village. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's great to see it actually propagating out there as we fully intended it to do. Uh, so I'm sorry Mr. Maurice Williamson, um, but 3D printing is not nanotechnology. Um, we, we squirt blobs of plastic or, or, or resin or, or whatever. Uh, we do not yet manipulate atoms um, to, to form gems and drugs. Um, but you can, you can see it from where we're standing. You, it's not too hard to imagine um, a, uh, what you use as atomic force microscopes and things like that. It's not too hard to see some, if not all, of the uh, hardware being printed on 3D printers um, in the not too distant future. In fact, now there's, there's probably somebody doing it right now. Um, and once you have nanotechnology, then anything that can be made uh, will be made. Um, and perfectly, because there's pretty good QA on atoms. Um, so, meanwhile, um, how will 3D printers actually drive society while we're waiting for these African geeks to get hold of nanotechnology? Um, well, they put the design of things back in the hands of the people who want to use the stuff, you and I. Um, devices will work, that you, devices that you make, after they've been through a few iterations, you know, nobody gets it right on version one, do they? Uh, they will work like you want them to. They will be the size you want. They will be available in the number that you want them of. Like you, you have to, you, you want to put a screw in the wall, you go to the DIY store, you have to buy a sort of 20 pack of those little plugs that go in the wall, right? If you only wanted four, you know, oh yeah, and they're probably about five mil too short, yeah, yours will be the right size in the quantity you want, in the color you want, when you want them. Um, and it's, it's, it seems only a small thing, but there are lots and lots of small things. Uh, and as the capabilities of 3D printers grow, uh, you'll be able to, to, to um, have more of the, the consumables that you require made on 3D printers. Um, and it won't actually cost you very much, and you'll start down the path of what we, we in the rep rap uh, group like to call wealth without money. Uh, so, this of course uh, kind of relies on people actually being able to design things. Um, at the moment, the, the sleigh station wins. All right? Kids are more inclined to sit in front of the sleigh station and, and fight war of whatever and uh, go into hyperspace and all these things. Uh, but what, what I like is the way that they are actually creating things in those 3D realms. They are, without realizing it, doing CAD. All right? uh, and in these 3D realms, you're starting to see uh, improved physics engines. I mean, in Minecraft, there's some fairly convoluted stuff, right, that you, you, can, you can use to create logic, so you can have a flame setting fire to a rock or some, uh, some such thing. So and you can sort of manage to rig logic gates and things out of it, stuff like that. They'll, they'll do that. They, they, they won't actually sort of design it with, with, with proper um, circuit schematics and everything. No, no, but they're quite happy to play with torches and burning sheep and whatever. Um, but we can now reach into those virtual worlds. Uh, have, a, have a look at mine ways, by the way. It's, it's, it's great. And you can, take some, you can take a chunk of Minecraft and you can print a chunk of Minecraft on a 3D printer. All right, it's a great way of getting kids involved in 3D printing, actually. So as the, uh, as the game engines improve and the accuracy gets better, you'll be able to start taking functional objects from the 3D world from the virtual world and bringing them out of a 3D printer. Uh, so hopefully those people will get engaged in the real world again by a somewhat circuitous route. Um, oh yes, Mindways is open source, which is kind of nice. Uh, so <laughs> while we're on to making things like that and copying them, the brainiac who thought that one up right, probably regret, regrets it on a daily basis. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so what we hear, have here is that the, the, the Firin S R3 hasn't been built yet. That's actually important. Um, we have the Strati, which is 
uh, I think the closest we actually got to a 3D printed car. Um, and uh, up there we've got a Honda, I'm sorry, I'm not a car nut, so I can't tell you, I'll probably tell you what it is, but Honda actually want you to download and print little models of, ca models of cars and give them out. They think it's great advertising. Uh, so yeah. But the, uh, the, the, the Ferrance R3 um, hasn't actually been built yet, but it's been designed, and as soon as the technology comes along, you'll be able to print it out. You won't have to wait for somebody to design it. It's already been done. Um, we, we are designing a lot of things that we can't make yet. Um, but, you know, uh, you don't have to wait very long, and that'll change. Uh, and when you do print a Ferrance R3, uh, for, your, for, for your daughter to go around and burn up down the local road. Um, you, you're not going to actually, because you're going to want to drive this, right? So you're not going to print it with a speed limiter in, are you? Really? No. And if you start sort of uh, printing your own uh, music playing equipment and stuff, right? You're not going to put sort of anti-copy DRM on your own media player, are you? All right? Yeah, and um, if you've uh, got a whole load of uh, wonderful 3D printable shoe designs to print out, all right, there, there is absolutely no reason why anybody would want to print out a pair of Crocs, for example. <laughs> all right. Um, but some, some people get a bit too enthusiastic and they think, oh, I'm going to design this fantastic new 3, 3D printer, it's, it's going to be wonderful, and I'm going to sell it for $300 and I want to set up a Kickstarter. No, it's not going to work that way. Um, you, can't, you can't, well, you might be able to sell a machine for $300. Um, you're not going to make much of a profit on it. Uh, you're not going to be able to support it. You're not going to be able to fund the next version. Uh, and you're not going to be able to pay anybody any salary on $300 a machine uh, and you see all these wondrous thing, uh, all these wondrous 3D printer ideas pop up on Kickstarter and then disappear. Um, it's actually quite sad and I would rather people just took proven open source designs and use them as the basis for uh, their 3D printer Kickstarter projects rather than trying to reinvent their own patentable pocketable wheel. Um, anyway, the um, the nice thing about all these Kickstarter projects and everything is that they do actually come up with, a, with some stuff that is useful for makers. And so we, we end up with all these little modular bits and pieces that we can put together to make um, not, not just sort of uh, light up costumes and things, but we, we, we can make 3D printers with bits that are now basically commodity products uh, coming out of China. and. The, the board that's in there, in that machine, has five stepper motor drivers on it. It has three high current drivers on it. It's got a whole load of inputs. It's got servo drivers. Uh, it's got a display driver. It's got an SD card reader, right? You, you, it's, it's quite a flexible little box of tricks in its own right. And uh, these things um, tie in very nicely with the maker movement. The 3D printer ties all the physical, uh, makes all the physical hardware to tie all these things together that turn them into fancy robots or dishwashers or whatever it is you want to make. Uh, and that's a, that's a, a very interesting, um, yeah, that's a very interesting path. And I, I think that's uh, that's really where a lot of the development is. It's not in the 3D printer itself. It's in the things that our people are do. It's the things that people do with 3D printing. Um, I I make and sell these things, in case nobody guessed. Um, and we sell them to, um, to to engineering companies and and things like that. Not not huge, massive engineering companies, but uh, uh, you know small outfits. Um, I mean, if somebody in uh, in, in a uni wants to work on um, printing cell cultures or something like that. They don't go out and get one of the big Stratasys machines or something because like you need, uh, they have maintenance contracts and technicians and warranties which don't like being voided and if you sort of take out the plastic and start pouring biological goop into them they sort of tend to get a bit soggy and hard to light about the maintenance contract. But with a 3D printer that's open source 
uh, you are encouraged and people will help you uh, do this. You will get all the diagrams, you will get the software that you modify and, uh, and um, hack, which is something that the commercial world is just never going to offer you. Um, we find that uh, people are now starting to use 3D printing as it was intended for rapid prototyping, but also uh, in ways we, we never really intended uh, originally for, for example, just making jigs to make things work in the work. You know, you, you, you want to make sure a hole is drilled in the right place. You make a special clamp with a hole in the top, and that's where your drill goes. Bang, you can drill holes in the right place all the time. Um, so we got things for putting uh, a threaded rod, uh, uh, threaded holes in exactly the right place. We got uh, novel foot plates for sewing machines and all sorts of things coming out of it. Um, up the top there, that's um, a a jet boat impeller uh, being poured in high tensile steel. Uh, the, um, the, the ob original object has been baked out of the mould and in goes the high tensile steel. Uh, now this, uh, having, uh, having the ability to do this on a, on a small scale, just making you know, half a dozen of something um, in a small field like that where uh, you, know, you have very, very short custom runs required by local people in a hurry for specialist purposes. That, that's where 3D printing is really coming into its own. It's helping out the local artisan. It's giving them tools that they need to remain competitive and flexible and survive, whether they're an artisan in, um, in, you know, in Auckland or, or whether they're some guy uh, working out of a little hut in Africa. Um, they both have uh, this, this wonderful tool that they can now use and, um, well, for the poor buggers in Africa, survival is a little bit more literal than than some, some lucky white guy in Auckland. So, um, there are lots of claims about 3D printings, uh, printing. Well, I'm going to print a house with my 3D printer is a, is a good one. Um, these, uh, the, these don't really tend to be practical projects uh, or uh, often they turn out to be complete vaporware. Um, the, the one up there is actually printing in Adobe. So the, the idea is instead of having to, to import cement and, and all that sort of business, you, you import this printer, you feed it sand, clay, water, a bit of electricity, and it goes and prints a mud hut, essentially. Um, uh, mud structures, Adobe structures, are actually very, uh, 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 very strong, very light, they're very durable. Um, all you have to do is splash a bit of mud on the outside of them every five years to make up for the erosion. It worked quite well. Um, that one, unfortunately, is, uh, is hobbit-sized. Um, so maybe you could house pygmies with it, but um, needs a little bit of work. Uh, there are uh, a few little bits of problems uh, that people haven't thought about fully with 3D printing houses. The, 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 the obvious one to me is um, can you imagine going to a local council and saying, well, I'm just going to build this house uh, using software I downloaded off the internet. Um, are there any planning issues with that? Um, and I think you might find uh, that there might be one or two. And <laughs> you thought they had problems with 3D printed guns, you know. Um, actually, uh, guns aren't a problem, okay? There are lots of guns around, people have access to guns, it's not hard. It only takes a few brain cells to think, ooh, I can print a gun. It takes a few more brain cells to realize, hey, I could actually buy those parts in the DIY store for five bucks and it wouldn't blow up in my face. Um, no, no, Three, don't worry about people who are 3D printing guns, all right? They're, they're, they're just, so they'll self-eliminate eventually. Uh, the, the, um, what you have to watch are the people who are actually thinking about it. Because when you've got a tool that is as powerful as a 3D printer, the gun is the least of your worries. Let's take a look at this little chap here. This is a 3D printed quadcopter. All right? It's equipped with GPS and cameras, so you can follow it, and some rudimentary tracking software. 
so it can find something and follow it and land by it. All right. So if you've got one of those, okay, and you combine it with one of those, which for those of you who are not familiar with these things is called a pipe bomb, then you might think you have somewhat more of a problem than someone having a gun, because they don't even have to look at you to get you with it. But you haven't got a problem yet. No, not yet. This is the internet. These are 3D printers. Now you've got a problem. Because <laughs> if you've got the, 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 the sort of kamikaze drone equivalent of a flash mob, bearing down on you, you are really in trouble. Alright? So, that, that's why every time somebody comes up with the concept of 3D printed guns, I start thinking, hey, this is a bit of a joke. Alright? So, um, what can we do about this? You know? Well, you don't have to print guns. Given the internal combustion engine, right? Human race, some of them have gone off, they've built tanks, all right? Uh, built bomber aircraft and all sorts of things. Uh, other people have taken the internal combustion engine and they've put it in ambulances and emergency generators and stuff like that, all right? I think that what we've got to do is, is, as they say, think of the children, all right? Don't think about the the politicians running around with, the, uh, with their scare stories and everything. Uh, 3D printing is producing life changes, uh, life, um, uh, life changing devices. In some cases, life preserving devices. People are making emergency uh, medical equipment in places where it's difficult to import it. Um, and uh, things like, uh, say, an, uh, an airway for someone that has to be of the right size. You can't imagine a little, a little outlying African hospital keeping stocks of everything, right? If they, if they need an airway to save a child of such and such a diameter, um, then they can go and print it. If they run out of clamps or whatever, they can, they can print more. Um, so these, you know, there are a lot of kids that get uh, prosthetics 3D printed for them. Um, and the reason is because kids grow out of prosthetics really fast. I and mean, if you ever thought, thought you had a problem with kids growing out of their shoes, all right, or, um, or, or losing them, or breaking them, all right, this little kid, she breaks a finger, she prints a new one. Yeah? No, no, you, you, you've got to get this, this, this balance of, of good and bad uh, right. And um, uh, people are trying to make you scared of terrorists with plastic swords and all sorts of things. It's, no, it's, that's not being done for your benefit. Um, you, you want 3D printing because it can make things for you that nobody else is going to make for you. A uh, classic example that I use here is, uh, and it is say you've got um, Lego, right? Everybody knows Lego, yeah? Uh, Kinex, does everybody know Kinex? Sort of connecting together toy thing, all right? Now, wouldn't it be great if you could plug your Kinex toy into your Lego? Yeah, that would be awesome. The kids could, could have some great crossover fun there. Very, very educational, all right? But Lego aren't going to make that. Kinex aren't going to make it either. But your 3D printer can make it any size and any color you want. Yeah. So there are things that, that, you, that, that you will benefit from that nobody is going to make for you, that you're only going to get through, through 3D printing. Um, it lets you source things locally. People can make stuff like, I mean, I don't imagine that everybody is going to have a 3D printer in the house. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a nice dream, but really people aren't ready for 3D printers yet. Uh, what they really want is they want somebody else to do it for them. Yeah, so you'll, you'll have somebody in the local community, rather like uh, in the old days, the village blacksmith. It was the one who would actually bang stuff together for you. You'd come along, tell him what you want, and he'd go and make it for you on demand. I can see that uh, that's starting to happen a lot more. 
Uh, I mean, you, you guys are probably smart enough to run 3D printers, but you know, how many of your friends do you think could actually design something? Yeah, it's kind of hard. Um, when you start making things for yourself, a whole load of restrictions on uh, commercial development go out the window. Uh, for example, um, if I print myself a Rolex, right, I'm, as long as I don't try and sell it to anyone, I'm not counterfeiting anything. All right? Yeah? I haven't made a counterfeit. I've made myself a copy of a Rolex, and I am allowed to do that as long as I don't try and sell it to anyone as a Rolex. So if I, um, if I make something that's patented for myself, I'm still not breaking the law. I'm not bre breaking any patent law. I can make patented things for myself, for my own use, as long as I don't try and sell them to somebody or sell services based on it to anyone. All right. Now, where this starts to get interesting is when we do start to get to the point where people can make machines that can make drugs. Right? You're not going to be able to print the drugs, but you might be able to print the little drugs factories. Then you'll be able to print a machine that can make your own patented cancer drug, right? but you're not breaking any patent law. So there's a whole load of things that 3D printing frees you from. Um, that, that are so hugely beneficial that you, you really don't want to throw them away um, in the bath water. The downside is, of course, uh, that dangerous objects are now no longer um, something that you can solve with legislation. That you can't sort of like ban the import of dangerous object X because people can just create it. Um, so it's not sort of a technical problem, it's now a people problem. And what this, uh, what this sort of means is that society uh, now has to be addressed uh, rather than uh, blockaded and threatened uh, in order to uh, try and get people to behave sensibly with, with the dangerous stuff. So, um, well, if you don't like the way your society is going, you do, of course, now have the option of printing a new one. <laughs> so uh, that, that's me, and I'm guessing people have got the occasional question about 3D printers and stuff. Could you print me a printer to take home? Could I print you a printer to take home? Uh, not tonight, I couldn't print you a printer to take home. This, it, this one is for sale. This, yeah. It this, has been printed. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, could, I could print you possibly a very small 3D printer. Um, just scale it down a bit, you know. Uh, no. Um, three, to, to print a 3D printer um, prob probably would take you a couple of days, maybe three, to, to print the parts for a 3D printer, and then you'd have to add your own nuts, bolts, motors, and, and what have you. But um, yeah, you can come and. Come and Yeah. The three days of actual yeah. And doing. Yeah, and there's also the problem of assembling it and calibrating it. Exactly. All right. Um, it's yes, you can print a 3D printer, but you've printed a three. You have printed a um, a machine tool. It is now your job to calibrate it and figure out how to use it. All right. Um, the, the, these 3D printer things. We see this a lot. Um, people buying a 3D printer and they think they bought something that's like a photocopier. All right? Yeah, yeah chunk, push button, out, cut, right. Well, they're really disappointed when they realize they bought a machine tool and they've actually got to figure out how to use it. All right? That's, um, that, that's a bit of a problem that we have. Uh, there was somebody there waving a hand. I was wondering if cost involved in, say, you know, making one or buying um, one. Well, yeah, how, how much does it cost to make one? Well. Um, basically about, um, uh, about uh, 50 bucks a kilo if you're using quality stuff. Um, that's, that's probably enough to, to make a printer or two. Uh, 50 bucks, uh, uh, I mean the, these objects don't have to be solid, you see, you can sort of put a crisscross inside. Uh, it's called infill, make it honeycomb infill or 
um, cross line infill or Escher bird shaped infill or, or whatever you really want. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. Yep. Um, um, how has the speed of printing changed in the time that 3D printers have been there and how do you see that going in the future? Mm. Uh, yeah. how, how fast do it Yeah, how, how fast do these 3D printers work and how is it developed? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the printers that we are making now run about 20 times faster than the one in, uh, that, that, I, 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 that is in that photo that haunts me everywhere. Um, the, a, a lot of that is actually in software. Um, if you can model how the uh, uh, if you can model how the plastic is going to behave and how your machine is going to behave when you swing it around, uh, then you can uh, you can make it uh, you can sort of like pre distort your object so that it actually comes out right at the end. Um, and and so uh, that's 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 one way things are advancing. The other thing is at the moment most of our printing is done with one nozzle. And now there are some uh, nice machines that uh, that sort of have the nozzle out on a on a sort of arm. And if you get two of those machines close enough, you can theoretically get them to both cooperate on the same object. Uh, that allows you to make a multi-material object or a single material object twice as fast, roughly. And so uh, I think that what what's, we're going to see in the future with speeding up 3D printing is uh, parallel production. Yeah. Um, this one, we'll have one from the back there. Yeah. Hi. So um, a lot of these projects, uh, these 3D printed projects, are the uh, fused deposit modeling, so they're square plastic. Yeah. Do you see open source SLS? So stereo latest, um, mm. you know, the melting of, I can't remember the actual term, but melts up metallic particles to, to build yeah. things that way, like a lot of the commercial 3D printers, or the ones that shoot lasers into resin to harden that way. Do you see that happening anytime soon? Right. Um, for, for, for the benefit of people without a microphone up there, um, yeah, how, how, how do I see uh, 3D printers that uh, work on systems other than just laminating layers of plastic um, progressing. Uh, well, you mentioned the laser sintering and things. Have you ever tried importing a laser? Yeah. Do you see why they aren't going to work very well? Yeah. Uh, you can't make a laser very easily and the government are dead against people getting high-powered lasers. So all this fancy stuff about doing high-power laser stuff at home, no, forget it. You're not going to be allowed. Um, there are, there are other technologies coming along. There are uh, photo setting resins. Yep, um, you can you can do some clever things with photo setting resins and taking like um, uh, an LCD display screen and shining really bright, or an overhead projector, uh, or one of these uh, projection television things, shining that into resin and getting it to polymerize. Uh, the problem is that the um, resin is kind of expensive and not exactly non-toxic and also it's, it, it, um, it's really expensive to start contaminating the resin or changing it halfway through an object so it's all going to be made out of the same stuff. Uh, so there are a whole load of limitations around these technologies which produce some, I must admit, do produce some really nice high resolution stuff. Um, but they're, they're, they're not really going to come into the same uh, sort of um, maker space sphere as, uh, as the uh, fusion deposition modeling. Perhaps things uh, like um, uh, plaster printers and that, and maybe uh, some of the larger uh, scale powder printers that don't actually need a laser, they can work with a hot air jet or something like that. that you might see more of that coming in uh, into, the, into the maker space. Yeah. Um, you, sir. In uh, the Netherlands, we have seen uh, a kind of social grassroots movement starting up. We have about 20 fab labs. Yes. And they are, most of them are in schools or in uh, bicycle shops. And the interesting thing I'm a fab lab. The, <laughs> yeah. the skilled people yeah. or the retired people from factories, mm. they Yes. So, so they are 
they teach young people in the Yes, yes, the, the fab labs are a very important way of, of, of spreading skills, um, not just the skills you need to put three, uh, 3D printers together, but also a bit of common sense that you need about how to apply any tool uh, that really you only gain through experience. Um, uh, fab labs are great. Um, my, my company is a fab lab. Uh, we, what we do is we, we, we have a factory, we make 3D printers in the week, uh, Saturday morning, doors open and people can come in, use the equipment. Um, and also sometimes some of the young ones, they teach the old fellas some new tricks as well. They show them how they can apply, say, the 3D printer to, to, to their jewellery making business or something like that. It's, uh, yeah, Fab Labs are very worthwhile, support them all you can. Yeah. Uh, Last question. We have this chat. Can you repeat the question as well? Yeah. Thank yeah. Right, uh, just, just a couple of points. There's, there's one in China now, uh, one of the deposit types. It uh, builds a house, albeit a, a somewhat small one, hmm. that uh, builds a house inside 24 hours. Uh, but my question is actually uh, printing mediums. Uh, is it possible yet to, uh, and I've got a specific example, I'm interested in uh, a combination of uh, carbon fibre, Kevlar and polymer. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to get that uh, put through as a meeting yet? Yeah, um, okay. You're asking, well first of all you're making the point that uh, in China they're printing houses. Yeah, um, most of those are actually, they're printing prefabricated slabs which are then hoisted up into place rather than printing the, the, the house from the, from the bottom up. But I do, I do have a, a presentation tomorrow, the, the 3D printing in 30 minutes thing, um, and I've got some, uh, some of the latest stuff coming out of China, and um, it's, it's way more impressive than just building houses, and some of those puppies are big. All right, uh, now the, the second you asked us about uh, putting other materials into the polymers, uh, such as uh, Kevlar, carbon fibre, things like that. Uh, yes, uh, we have already put carbon fibre into, uh, into the polymer and it's, it doesn't actually add a lot of strength to the polymer as you would have thought. What it ends up doing is it does add a lot more stiffness. So um, it makes it suitable for making, well, printing quadcopters, for example. Um, and the clever thing about uh, printing uh, with uh, fiber loaded filament on a 3D printer like this is because it works by squeezing the plastic out of a little hole in the bottom uh, when you actually run your fiber loaded filament through and start drawing with it what you end up doing is you end up aligning all those fibers together so you, you, actually, you actually put grain into the fiber so if you adjust your next layer so it's deposited at an angle, you can do the cross-ply thing that they normally do when they're building up layers of, of carbon fibre composites. Are you in Auckland? I am in Auckland, yes, in Henderson. Yeah. Yeah. You can, uh, I've got some samples in the workshop. You can sort of hit me up for some. Um, so, so yes, fibre-loaded fibre filaments are, are a reality. All right, uh, that was the last question, and uh, thank you very much. Awesome.